Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coeur. David Jolly, I'd like you to pull back the lens a little bit and just tell me what it tells you about this president that when sitting with his war cabinet ostensibly to discuss an American reaction to the atrocities in Syria he sure. described the attack on our country as a raid of his personal attorney and fixer's files he um, has talked about being at war with Bob Mueller, um, someone who uh, earned um, a Purple Heart for combat valor. He has been at constant war against his own political appointees at the Justice Department, at the FBI. Um, anyone who covers the Justice Department or the FBI knows that that has had an effect on morale, the constant barrage of harassment on Twitter. And now we are having a round-the-clock conversation about whether he will or will not fire Mueller, whether he will or will not fire Rod Rosenstein, not over any difference in policy, not over any divide about how or whether to prosecute someone who threatened America, but about the guy who paid money to the porn stars he slept with. That's right. Uh, Nicole, look, this is a president who is increasingly behaving like a guilty man as well as an increasingly unstable man. And I think the reason why is his attorneys have pointed something out to him that, that Harry just mentioned, and we can't overlook this piece. Mueller and Rosenstein may have just pulled the greatest end around Donald Trump in this investigation that nobody saw coming, and it's this. By referring this matter to the Southern District of New York, it ensures that this legal exposure and culpability between Trump and Cohen survives the dismissal of Mueller and survives the dismissal of Rosenstein. And why that matters is an impeachable event does not arise out of an investigation by the special counsel. If you take the Bill Clinton standard where it was perjury in a civil case, obstruction in a civil case, the Mueller probe can be shut down. But because Trump and Cohen are now involved in this legal exposure in the Southern District of New York, if Trump is found to be legally culpable, that can still be an impeachable matter for the U.S. Congress. Harry, let me let you respond to that. Well, I think he's exactly right. Um, but, but even more than that, it puts maximum pressure on Cohen and really puts to the test his avowal over these many months that he would take a bullet for Trump. You know, he is not just Mr. Fix-It. He is, he boasts himself that he's uh, considered Trump's sixth child or his Tom Hagen, referring to the, the godfather, that he would jump out of a building. Well, we'll see, because when the Southern District of New York begins to pile up charges uh, and really puts him at, at risk of decades in prison, that's going to uh, really test his loyalty and mettle. It is Friday the 13th in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. And uh, we might as well because it is Friday the 13th, an ominous date in the annals of history. Yep, and probably even more so now because uh, 
I think the alignment of the planets and the numerology of the cosmos has finally pulled on the light tethered, lightly tethered strings of one Donald J. Trump. Yes, um, Comey's come out with a book, and uh, there's some advanced copies of it out there for people to know about, and if people know about it, Trump knows about it, because they've been talking about how bad Comey is on Fox, and uh, that's where Trump gets his information. Uh, it's interesting to note, today, Trump's uh, schedule uh, has him getting his intelligence briefing, and uh, I, I think that's just when he turns on the TV and watches Fox. So he must be getting intelligence briefings, you know, early in the morning, and then he probably gets it again, you know, sometime in the afternoon, and then he gets it for quite a while at night. A lot of uh, fear that uh, the uh, S is coming down, and uh, they may be right. Uh, you know, we, as, as David alluded to during his show, we may... We may be going live uh, uh, when, you know, the ass hits the fan. Because uh, that's what we do here at Netroots Radio. We do have a, a quite extensive panel from the blogosphere that will be joining us, not all at once, but uh, because that's, I got to tell you, a little secret. It's technologically impossible to have more than a half a dozen people, okay? We've tried, but uh, no, we'll be cycling folks throughout the course of the day when it happens. So stay tuned to Netroots Radio for that. Uh, and and with with all that's uh, you know coming about right now, and it being the weekend, yeah, uh, AIDS and you know, well, unnamed AIDS to Trump are uh, expressing fear that he's. Uh, Becoming untethered. And this morning was uh, quite an example when he tweeted out how much of a leaker and a liar Comey is and that Comey should be prosecuted. Yeah, projecting once again. So he does that. You know, mob boss, mob boss, you're the mob boss. Tremendous pressure is building and it's coming crashing down. Why is Trump pardoning Scooter Libby? Well, because Scooter Libby obstructed justice. He lied in front of Congress, among many other things. Uh, and let's not forget, outed a CIA agent and endangered her lives. And people did die from that outing. And, uh, no, not Scooter Libby divulging it, but he was part of the cabal that did. So, um, uh, pardoning him is uh was was sort of like a pre announcement to the rage tweeting that we are experiencing or had experienced this morning because uh it'll be afternoon soon and it'll be rage tweeting this afternoon so uh uh pardoning scooter libby is uh you know kind of like a little uh middle finger salute and that's what mob bosses do don't they yes indeed well, um, we could go on and on. We could talk about Paul Ryan, you know, <laughs> retiring at 48. Yeah. And, you know, he'll probably be stopping by a Burger King or a Carl. Do they have Carl's Jr. back there? Maybe not. Hardee's. He'll stop at a Hardee's and, uh, uh, you know, 72-year-old woman will be wiping the table because she has to work and because he stole her, her retirement uh, because she's just a lazy person and just needed to feel some pain. That's what they always like to do. They're not populist. Trump's not a populist. Here, feel some pain. He is a mob boss, and we've known that uh, from the beginning. And, uh, you know, uh, certainly 60-some million people thought that uh, mob boss is uh, the right president for the right time. And I am here to tell you that that's not true, because we here at Netroots Radio, uh, well, we are Resistance Radio. So let's look at what we're going to attend to today with the stories that we have curated. Okay, well, Trump and his fixer facing the Southern District of New York courtroom. Well, David Jolly says that's a classic end run around. Okay. It's an end around play, just so Jolly knows. I don't think he's played football, but that's it's an end around play. 
On the rest of the menu in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Well, here's some heartening and good news. Former GOP Texas Congressman Steve Stockman is found guilty of those 23 felonies that uh, we reported when he was first charged with them. And when I say we, I mean me. Why am I? Uh, I just referred to myself in the roar, royal we. Oh, my God. Oh, boy. I got, well, okay. <laughs> CIA Director Mike Pompeo. Here's some poppin' peas. <laughs> Cannot remember if Trump asked him to obstruct the Russia probe, but he's per- pretty sure that Trump didn't do anything wrong. Okay. And 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 Mike Pompeo would know because uh, while he was saying that, and while he was CIA director, he had a secret business with the Chinese government. Yeah, the CIA director with uh, you know a foreign power is supposed to be at odds with us. Law and order, indeed. Okay. And the Seattle Seahawks postponed Colin Kaepernick's workout with the team after he refuses to abandon his protest against police violence and systemic racism. And Reuben Foster beat the crap out of his girlfriend, uh, uh, cracked an eye socket. Uh, what was the other thing? There was some other horrendous, uh, uh, broke, uh, busted up her eardrum. Bruises all over, and uh, uh, yeah, he's still with the team so far, but he's still with the team. And yeah, I know Reuben Foster took a knee during the protest, but he's a hypocrite, and he's still on the team, okay? Because football is a game of violence. Colin Kaepernick was uh, protesting violence, and that is disrespecting the game and America, apparently. But Reuben Foster, by beating the crap out of his girlfriend, rupturing her eardrum, cracking an eye socket, bruises all over, honors the game, America, God on high. And so far, he's still with the team. After the break, we'll move to the chef's table where that North Korean malware, not seen since the 2014 attack on Sony, has now returned and is raising the possibility of future destructive attacks. It's Friday the 13th, folks. We had to get that one in there. And the White House does not seem to know that if you screw with scientists, scientists will screw you back. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Go to the bottom of our homepage at edwardsradio.com. You'll notice on the right is of the page, the chat room link. Uh, our roaring girl, Kelly Lincoln, <clears throat> monitors that throughout the day. So a good place to contact us. Another good place to contact us would be to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. You can also follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And uh, do check out the Daily Coast Diary I post about 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, that has all the show notes and links and other pertinent entertaining information for your perusal. Also, you know, I should mention that uh, the a reprise of each daily West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is kind of like uh, seconds. Yeah, uh, uh, does uh, happen at uh, 5 p.m. on the West Coast, and that would be 8 p.m. on the East Coast, Monday through Friday. So uh, if you missed today and you want to listen to it later on in the day, you can. And then podcasts where you can listen to it whenever you want can be found by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Yes. 
Okay, I guess we should get right into these articles here. And uh, this first one is out of the Texas Tribune. And let me scroll down here. They do not give me a name of, of a reporter. So, uh, okay, nameless worker bees at the Texas Tribune pen this piece. Steve Stockman, a former Republican or Actually, he's a Republican former congressman from Texas, has been convicted of defrauding two conservative mega donors and funneling their one and a quarter million into personal and campaign expenses as part of what prosecutors have described as a white collar crime spree. Mm-hmm. I don't think they shot him dead in his backyard when he held his cell phone. <sighs> That's what happens in white-collar crime sprees now. A jury in federal court in Houston ruled yesterday afternoon that Stuckman is guilty of all but one of the 24 felonies he was charged with last March. After about 16 hours of deliberations over three days, the 12-person panel only declined to convict on one of four counts of wire fraud. Stockman will appeal the verdict. His defense team said, of course they do. Uh, Stockman is keep Mr. Stockman is keeping his head up and we're looking forward to getting through to the next stage of this. Defense attorney Sean Buckley said the verdict puts Stockman, a firebrand conservative who served two non consecutive terms in the U.S. House before losing a 2014 challenge to U.S. Senator John Cornyn at is at risk of decades in federal prison. And in the immediate future, it sends him into federal custody where he will remain pending sentencing in August. U.S. Marshals took him into custody shortly after the verdict was read. Over the objections of his lawyers, the prosecution had warned that he might be a flight risk. Oh, truly. Stockman has been on trial in federal court in Houston for nearly a month on corruption charges that include mail fraud, wire fraud, money laundering, and violations of federal election law. As he heard the jury's verdict Thursday, he sat expressionless, according to the Houston Chronicle. Okay, let's see. Uh, Ryan Patrick, the new U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas and the son of Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, was in the courtroom for the verdict. When public officials use their office to defraud vote donors and violate federal law, we will hold them accountable. Patrick said in a statement. Corrupt officials like former Congressman Stockman make it harder for the honest ones to do their jobs. Let me translate for you. When public officials use their office to defraud donors and violate federal law and they get caught and it really makes it hard for everybody else to be able to use their office to defraud voter vote to defraud donors and violate federal law, it, 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 it's hard. It's hard. And he has to be held accountable for that because you don't, you don't ever disrespect the family. Okay. Let's see. Stockman was accused of improperly using charitable donations for unrelated efforts, including campaign and personal expenses, ranging from a new dishwasher to undercover surveillance of a perceived political rival. Because this is what Banana Republic Republicans do. The Houston area former lawmakers' attorneys have claimed that the pair of conservative mega donors who gave him that money intended for it to serve as campaign contributions and gave the former lawmaker broad leeway for using it. The dishwasher is obviously used to launder something. Okay. Prosecutors argued that Stockman promised that money would go to specific purposes, including educating voters and renovating a conservative freedom house for interns, and that the former lawmaker used his credibility to mislead donors. Well, grifters got a grift, and rubes that uh, are psychophants like uh, maybe these mega donors are, I think they expect to be grifted. That's just me. 
There has been so much uh, rhetoric publicly about Congressman Stockman and his political views. We're in such a politically charged environment that I cannot say I'm surprised by anything his lawyer said, but I am disappointed, and I don't think it's the right result. If held up on appeal, the felony conviction would make Stockman ineligible to seek Texas office, but the U.S. Constitution, which lays out eligibility requirements for federal office, does not exclude convicted felons from seeking election to the U.S. Congress. That's why uh, that coal baron, who, Blankenship, he, he went to jail for killing minors, and he's running uh, against Manchin. You know, I'm not a big fan of Manchin, but come on, Blankenship. And uh, he's violated federal election law while campaigning now, and he may go to jail also. It's almost like an affliction. Stockman was charged with two former aides, Thomas Dodd and Jason Posey, who both entered guilty pleas and testified against their former boss. The three faced 28 felony charges in total. Good riddance. offering here at the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is an article out of Share Blue Media by Carolyn Orr. Now, Mike Pompeo is in a hearing to become Secretary of State, replacing Rex Tillerson. His current job is one being CIA director. And he ought to know. But he sure forgot a lot about a lot of stuff. He was Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing. Pompeo gave a curious set of answers to a question about his involvement in the Russia investigation during his confirmation hearing Thursday to be the next Secretary of State. Asked by Senator Bob Menendez whether Trump ever asked him to do anything related to former Director James Comey's investigation into Michael Flynn, Pompeo said he doesn't recall while also insisting that Trump never asked him to do anything pro- improper. Okay. Menendez began his questioning by citing a 2017 Washington Post article that reported that Trump had asked Pompeo, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats, to personally interfere with former Director James Comey's investigation into Flynn. Asked what he had spoken about with Trump that day, Pompeo gave three different answers. First, Pompeo refused to answer, saying, I'm not going to talk to you about the conversations the president and I had. Question about whether Trump had asked him to do anything as it relates to the investigation. Pompeo responded, I I don't recall what he asked me that day precisely. Pompeo then added, but he has never asked me to do anything that I consider remotely improper. Well, of course, because Pompeo is a is a slime ball, a lying slime ball, and what he would think was improper would be uh, going against Herr Führer. You show disloyalty to the Herr Führer, you will suffer. Pompeo's answers seem to fl- flatly contradict one another. If he cannot remember what was asked of him, how can he remember that anything improper was asked of him? Notably, Pompeo did not deny that Trump asked him to intervene in Comey's investigation into Flynn. He only denied that Trump asked that Trump had asked him to do anything proper. Well, that obviously leaves open the possibility that Trump did ask him to intervene, but Trump or that Pompeo did not feel. It was improper to do so because they're all crooks. That Pompeo cannot outright deny that Trump asked him to obstruct a federal investigation is concerning, to say the least. Pompeo's relationship with Trump has raised questions before. 
And there's been a common thread running through most of Pompeo's decisions as CIA director. Pompeo doing and saying questionable things involving Russia and those questionable things tending to align with Trump. And his confirmation testimony needs to be added to that list of questionable things. Here on the Bistro Cafe is an article by Lindsay Gibbs out of Think Progress. Colin Kaepernick, who has been staying in shape and practicing his skills as a professional football quarterback, despite being unemployed from the NFL for over a year, was reportedly supposed to work out for the Seattle Seahawks this week. But uh, the Seahawks who desperately need a quality quarterback to back up their starter, Russell Wilson, postponed the visit when Kaepernick refused to promise that he would not take a knee during the national anthem to protest police brutality and systemic racism next season. This news comes just days after Pro Football Talk reported that Kaepernick's former San Francisco 49ers teammate and current free agent Eric Reed was also asked, this time during a visit with the Cincinnati Bengals, whether he plans to take a knee during the National Anthem next season. Reed, a Pro Bowl safety who took a knee during the National Anthem the past two seasons, refused to give the Bengals assurance that he would not kneel in the fall. And Kaepernick tweeted his support for Reed. Kaepernick first refused to stand, of course, during the National Anthem during 2016. And as it sta- as it as it was, after a fashion, uh, he and Eric Reed talked, and then they conferred with uh, Nate Boyer, a retired Green Beret and former NFL player. And the Green Beret said, "You know, just sitting—that's uh, kind of disrespectful." You know, what you need to do is what we would always do, and we would take a knee. And uh, Reed wrote that he uh, remembered thinking that the posture was like a flag flying at half-mast to mark a tragedy. And so it was born out of respect. You take a knee for the fallen. But only in a mob society would the fallen are considered to be the other. And you're honoring an other you do not. Go against the family. And I also have to say that since, uh, you know, there's a big time contract with the military and they get all those jet flyovers and the league gets a bunch of money to get that, uh, you know, honoring nonviolence, you can't have that in a violent society. And the worst thing you can do is have Spartacus out there leading the way. All right, let's get to our break, and we'll come back and go through uh, weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today on this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. You're listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, a trip to the 40s and the 80s. 
Fans of Ernest Cline's popular novel, Ready Player One, might be surprised at how different the Steven Spielberg-directed movie is from the novel, even though it's co-written by the book's author. While the plot and the core characters are the same, this adaptation is decidedly different in a way that has all the earmarks of a Spielberg movie. With lots of 80s music but set in 2045, Ready Player One tells the story of Wade Watts, a poor teen growing up in the so-called stacks, trailer homes stacked on top of each other, and who along with most of the world now finds virtual reality preferable to reality. This virtual world called Oasis is the brainchild of an enigmatic programmer named James Halliday, who has bequeathed half a trillion dollars in control of the virtual world to the first person to unlock three digital Easter eggs that he hid in the Oasis. Along with everyone else eager to win the prize, there's also an evil corporation called IOI in the hunt. The head of this company, played superbly by Ben Mendelsohn, will stop at nothing to win, and Wade and his virtual friends find themselves in increasing danger the closer they come to unlocking the secret eggs. Of course, since this is a Spielberg movie, many of the darker elements of the book are left out, including the death of a child player killed by IOI. While Ty Sheridan is okay as Wade, it's really the supporting cast that carries the day, including the aforementioned Mendelssohn, the sadly underused Lena Waithe, and Mark Rylance as Halliday. Indeed, Rylance comes across as a sort of Steve Jobs slash Willy Wonka figure. Even though only appearing as an avatar, he is arguably the best part of the film, which isn't bad, but falls far short of the book. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. Hi, I'm Scientific American podcast editor Steve Mursky. And here's a short piece from the April issue of the magazine in the section we call Advances. Dispatches from the Frontiers of Science, Technology, and Medicine. Hot Rocks by Shannon Hall. For the past 200 million years, New England has been a place without intense geological change. With few exceptions, there have been no rumbling volcanoes or major earthquakes. But it might be on the verge of awakening. Findings published this January in the journal Geology show a bubble of hot rock rising underneath the northern Appalachian Mountains, the feature was first detected in 2016 by EarthScope, a collection of thousands of seismic instruments sprinkled throughout the U.S. Vadim Levin, a geophysicist at Rutgers University, says this wealth of sensors lets Earth scientists peer under the North American continent, just as the Hubble Space Telescope has enabled astronomers to gaze deep into the night sky. Should the broiling rock breach the surface, which could happen, though not until tens of millions of years from now, it would transform New England into a burbling volcanic landscape. The finding has sparked many questions given that New England is not located along an active plate margin where one tectonic plate rubs against another, but sits squarely in the middle of the North American plate. The exact source of the hot rock bubble, for example, is unclear. Because the edge of the North American continent is colder than a plate near an active margin, Levin suspects this edge is cooling the mantle, the layer just below the crust that extends towards the Earth's core. As cold chunks of mantle sink, they may displace hotter segments which would rise toward the surface. Scientists believe they have now imaged such an ascending piece. Although it sounds simple, this scenario is, according to Levin, a story that at present does not have a place in a textbook. Or perhaps pieces of the North American continent are breaking off and sinking into the mantle, which would also push the warmer mantle upward, observes William Menke, a geophysicist at Columbia University who was not part of the study. Scientists do not yet know which model is correct or if an entirely different one may be involved. Levin and his colleagues are eager to collect more data to bring this unusual hotspot into sharper focus and in doing so flesh out the theory of plate tectonics. He says, we know little about the interior of our planet, and every time we look with a new light, we find things we did not expect. When we do, we need to rethink our understanding of how the planet functions. That was Hot Rocks by Shannon Hall. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. Today we launch a brief series on George Mason has often been called America's forgotten founder. Mason has not attained the status of a cultural icon that Americans have bestowed upon his Virginia colleagues, such as George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison. 
but his contemporaries certainly recognized his many talents and his historic achievements. Edmund Randolph, Virginia's governor, said that Mason ranked behind none of the sons of Virginia in knowledge of her history and interest. At a glance, he saw to the bottom of every proposition which affected her. Historian Ralph Ketchum wrote that Mason was widely acknowledged as having the most profound understanding of Republican government of any man in Virginia. Madison and Jefferson always defer to him as their mentor on matters of political theory. That's all for today's podcast. To learn more about George Mason, visit civiced.org slash mason. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1970. That was the day that Minneapolis Teachers Union Local 59 went out on strike. They took the vote to strike despite the fact that state law prohibited teachers from striking. But after months of negotiations that went nowhere, the teachers decided it was time to act. The main issue for the strike was wages. One teacher, George Kimball, recalled why he had supported the strike, stating, The wages were so low. I had five children at the time, and we could barely survive. We couldn't take it anymore. The strike lasted 14 days. The teachers did not win the gains they hoped for with their work action. But their strike drew public attention to the lack of bargaining rights for public sector workers. The next year, Minnesota Governor Wendell Anderson signed into law the Public Employees Labor Relations Act. This act granted public sector workers the right to collective bargaining. The Minneapolis teacher strike played a key role in Minnesota's public sector workers gaining the fundamental right of union representation. The 1960s and 70s saw a wave of teacher strikes across the nation as educators stood up for themselves as workers. Across the country, there were more than 1,000 teacher strikes between 1960 and 1974. More than three quarters Quarters of a million teachers walked out of the classroom and onto the picket lines. By the end of the 1970s, more than 70% of public school teachers were covered by collective bargaining agreements. For teachers concerned about class size, pensions, wages, school safety, and the quality of education, the strike remains an important way to build solidarity and to show the power of our nation's educators. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on Thursday, April 12, 2018. I'm C. Marie Ainsborough. As part of its ongoing efforts to improve the working conditions of women on banana plantations, the global union IUF has been organizing workshops for both employees and management. The IUF represents some 12 million workers in 130 countries. Recently, the Global Union, in cooperation with the NGO Banana Link, organized the Workshop of Workers in Ghana. Ajwa Saki is the IUF's African Women's Project Coordinator. She was asked about the barriers faced by women working on plantations. She refers to Golden Exotics, which is the leading producer of bananas and pineapples in Ghana. Some of the barriers are most of the industry lack childcare facilities and also issues around health and safety, especially regarding irregular menstruation and also low pay wages uh, at the industry. IUF Africa and Banana Link entered into commission a research to look at the barriers and attitudes of women's employment in Golden Exotic. And we, the title of the, the research is Improving and Increasing Women's Employment in Golden Exotic. I could see that there is a lot of positive around it. We have set ourselves some goals. The management, the workers themselves, the trade unions have come together to form advisory committee, which is going to rule the outcomes of the recommendations within the the workshop into implementation. And we have a two-year program to implement. One of, of, of it is how the company itself will change their lifestyle of employment to include women, expand some of the sectors specifically and make sure that women are employed. 
move forward to put issues around child care facilities and also improve on the conditions under which the whole, both men and women will work in that community. So there is positive and the management are prepared to support the implementation of this project with the cooperation of workers and the trade unions. And Banana Link and IUF support this program. The IUF partnered with the well-respected NGO Banana Link to organize the workshop in Ghana. Here is Banana Link Communications Officer Paul Levens. We're a small campaign group that works to promote ethical practices in the, in the tropical fruit um, industry, particularly bananas, which is, is what we're named after. But we also work um, in, in, in pineapples as well, which tend to be produced by the same companies in the same parts of the world using the same kind of production methods. And I've been a trade union activist all my life. And a major plank of, of what Banana Link does is to, to help support trade unions in um, the banana producing countries around the world. We are in Norwich and we've, we've stayed in Norwich, partly to, to establish links between the trade unions representing agricultural workers here in this part of the world, to build links between those trade unions and the trade unions in Latin America and West Africa. Twenty years on from when we started, that the concept of fair trade banana is something that's now it's well known amongst the public. They, they kind of understand the concept and understand that by paying a bit more for a fair trade banana, they're making a small contribution to, to helping the, the producers at the end of the line. Because of Banana Link activity and Banana Link campaigning, a lot of the supermarkets now in the UK only sell fair trade bananas. Tesco's sell a mixture of fair trade and rainforest certified. It's both consumers understand it and the supermarkets see the value in it. More recently, we've been campaigning against Fife's, the, the Irish multinational fruit giant, as a result of evidence that we received about labour rights abuses in Honduras and Costa Rica. Problems with things like not allowing people to join trade unions. I'm Sumeri Ainsborough. Thank you for listening. From UN headquarters in New York, I'm Luke Fargus with your World in Two Minutes. The European Commission has unveiled what it's calling a New Deal for Consumers, part of a broad effort to adapt consumer rules to the online world. Under proposals sketched out this week, EU citizens could see more transparency on online search engines, separating out natural search results from ads. They'll also enjoy consumer protections for free online services, remedies which currently exist only when money changes hands. But perhaps the most significant change would allow consumer rights groups to file lawsuits on behalf of groups of consumers, instead of relying on costly, time-consuming class action lawsuits. And the World Food Program is drawing attention to the problem of food waste with a new kitchen challenge. Open up your fridge and have a look at what's in there. Grab any ingredients that are close to their use-by date or look like they might have seen better days and create a meal using those ingredients. Chalice McDonough is the WFP spokesperson in Washington, D.C. That's food you might have otherwise thrown out or would have gone to waste. In the developing world, food is often lost closer to the farm with a lack of proper storage or refrigeration. But in the developed world, problems are more common closer to the point of purchase, with grocery stores wary of displaying perfectly edible food that looks just a little bit off. There's an awful lot of stuff that doesn't meet those cosmetic standards, um, but that is still perfectly delicious. Sure, the ugly foods are still tasty message is a good one, but McDonough says there's an even more important message behind the Recipe for Disaster campaign. The world grows enough food to feed the the 7 billion people who live on this planet, but still one in nine people go to bed on an empty stomach each night. One third of the food that's produced for human consumption globally is lost or wasted, which amounts to about 1.3 billion tons of food each year. Luke Fargus, the United Nations.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, because we are all Nighthawks in the diner of life. And even more so now that it's Friday the 13th, if you're into that sort of thing. Okay, let's uh, begin with weather from around the world, and we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 42 degrees. We are slated to be a little bit warmer than yesterday at 63. We were really uh, about 48 to 51 yesterday, so it's actually much warmer. So we're looking to be about 63 to 65 today. Our lows will be in the uh, low to mid 40s tonight. Uh, Looks like we'll have a little drying out period in the next couple of days. And then, uh, which is the weekend, which is fine because it's the pear blossom uh, festival this time of year in this part of Southern Oregon. So uh, maybe we'll have some drier weather, which would be nice to have fun with that. So uh, we do have another uh, bit of rain coming at the beginning of the week. And then uh, looks like we'll be drying out for a little bit. But I'm still hoping that minerals from the sky in liquid form will fall on my garden some more. Uh, air quality index is uh, good at 13, so I'll live with that. Uh, or my mom will have to live with it. It's not so bad. Uh, air pressure, or I'm sorry, pressure is holding steady at 30.39 inches. Visibility is at five miles. Uh, oh, humidity is 82%. Okay. Well, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased and these people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere in their property. And these people live around the world. Okay. London is, uh, London is, oh, 53 and cloudy. Paris is 63 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 68 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 65 and fair. Kabul is 63 and mostly cloudy. If you're planning a wedding, uh, go on the cloudy days and and also during electrical storms. Hard to fly those drones. So wedding parties should be uh, planned during inclement weather when in Kabul. Oh, uh, Hong Kong is 60, oh, I'm sorry, Hong Kong is 74 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 55 and fair. Sydney, Australia is 78 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 46 and fair. And New York, New York is 67 degrees Fahrenheit. And sunny, sunny springtime day it is. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase. These people planted these personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people live around the world. Starting off here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Friday is out of Foreign Policy Magazine by Elias Grohl and Jana Winter. American intelligence analysts have discovered a destructive strain of North Korean malware not seen since the 2014 attack on Sony that crippled the company's computer systems, according to the Department of Homeland Security documents obtained by Foreign Policy magazine. On December 17, 2017, advanced persistent threat actors deployed newly discovered destructive malware that shares a number of similarities to the destructive malware used in the Sony attack. This is the first known instance since 2014 that North Korea tied destructive malware has been seen, says the report marked for official use only. Well, uh, I think informing the American public is pretty damn official. So I'm doing it as well. The report does not state whether the malware called Smashing Coconut was deployed by North Korean hackers, but argues that the technical similarities make it very likely that it was developed by North Korea. 
Though the report states the malware can be linked back to North Korea, attributing specific attacks can be difficult. In February, U.S. intelligence officials concluded that a seeming North Korean cyber attack directed at the Winter Olympics in South Korea was really a Russian false flag operation. Now, that was according to the Washington Post, so we're not just making it up. And this is Foreign Policy Magazine, not really known for a liberal bias, if you get my drift. If North Korea was behind the smashing coconut attack, the malware marks a shift from Pyongyang's hackers, who in recent years have focused on attacking financial institutions and Bitcoin exchanges in an apparent attempt to procure hard currency as the regime faces strict sanctions. Now, that was by Eric Sheehan, who is an analyst at Symantec and a longtime observer of state-backed hackers. When North Korean hackers attacked Sony in 2014, in apparent retaliation for a film depicting the assassination of leader Kim Jong-un, its, oper- its operatives used a so-called wiper to delete large amounts of data from the company's computer systems. Since then, they have mostly shelved that tool. What is interesting to see here is that they are coming back with a wiper, the semantic analyst said. If in fact, North Korean hackers once more have a wiper in their arsenal, it may be an indicator that they are preparing for future attacks in which they delete data as in the Sony attack. When they have a political motivation to do it, they will, Sheehan said. Now, the Department of Homeland Security alerted the public to the wiper in an alert last month in a report that dubbed the malware Sharp Knot. The department would not comment on the reports obtained by Foreign Policy magazine. A DHS official speaking on condition of anonymity says the department has issued technical alerts over the last year to assist network defenders in understanding the types of malware used by North Korean hackers and urge network administrators to, quote, remove from their systems so that they cannot continue to have access to our infrastructure. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Okay, finishing up here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays Oh, and Merry Friday the 13th to you as well uh, This is uh, from the Times of Trenton Editorial Board, uh, Trenton, New Jersey They have a few things to say. State Assemblyman Andrew Zwicker, Democrat of the 16th Assembly, is dead right when he says science knows no political party. Republicans, Democrats, and everyone else on the political spectrum deserve access to breathable air, drinkable water, and all the other necessities of life that define a society that appreciates and acts on the expertise scientists provide us. It is no secret that the White House has declared an unofficial war on that very branch of knowledge, seeking to undermine years of effort and generations of progress. That is the unifying theme behind a march this Saturday through the streets of Trenton to encourage policymakers at all levels to make informed decisions based on proven scientific data rather than on the needs of money-hungry corporations. I should add that this Trenton March is only one of uh, thousands in towns, cities, villages all across the United States. 
back to uh, the, type, the Trenton editorial board here. I still believe that the American people respect and support science, but we all need to make clear uh, to the people elected to lead us, said Matthew Buckley, a physics professor at Rutgers University and a founder of last year's March in Trenton. The local event, which kicks off at 10 a.m. on the steps of the War Memorial at One Memorial Drive, echoes similar rallies across the nation and the world. More than one people gathered across the globe for the first March for Science last April, including about 6,000 people in the Garden State. They were protesting the erosion of scientific inquiry into such matters as climate change, medicine, public safety, and education. Since that time, March organizers say things have only gotten worse. The past year has seen crippling rollbacks in environmental protection, sharp decreases in funding for basic research, and restrictions on the free movement and expression of our nation's scientists. Zwicker, for one, has seen enough as an assemblyman and as a physicist. A speaker at last year's march and a member of the steering committee for this year's event, the Democratic lawmaker says his activism is driven by the urgent need to protect our children and grandchildren from political decisions that will have an impact for generations. As if to echo his words, the EPA this week made headlines for considering a major change in the way it assesses scientific work, a move seen as severely limiting the research available to its staffers when they go about crafting environmental regulations. The new policy, which will affect nearly every aspect of debate the agency conducts, is a boon to the fossil fuel industry, whose titans have long sought to dispute the link between polluted air and premature deaths, a link established 25 years ago in a definitive Harvard University study. The weather forecast for Saturday in Trenton is mostly sunny, with a high in the 70s. The outlook for science in the coming year should only be as rosy. Indeed. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, but not for Netroots Radio. We broadcast on, so stay tuned for uh, live content with uh, uh, Tom Hartman and Randy Rhodes and Mike Malloy and others throughout the course of the day. And if we have to, we will break in live with a very comprehensive panel to uh, break down the uh, political destruction of uh, America as we know it. So stay tuned for that. All right. And we will visit with you on Monday in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Ma robe à fleurs sous la 
Dans mon jardin d'hiver, dans mon jardin d'hiver. 